Thank you. Okay. Welcome to the largest screen in the Russell Senate Office Building. Um, also, thank you for coming to the fifth and final briefing in our five-part series, Farm Bill in Focus. I'm Dan Brissett. I'm the president of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute. And today, our look at the Farm Bill continues with conservation practices from farms to forests and wetlands. You could say, perhaps, that we save the best for last. In other words, we've conserved the, la the best briefing for last. That's about as punny as we're going to get today. If you came to the forestry briefing, there was a lot, a lot better puns, but just wanted to at least get that out there. Also, like to say huge thanks to the office of Senator Peter Welch for having us secure this room today uh, and for hosting and for um, bringing us all together for this really excellent conversation. EESI was founded in 1984 on a bipartisan basis by members of Congress to provide educational resources to policymakers about climate change topics. That means next year is our 40th anniversary and we're still going strong. Um, briefings like this are probably the highest profile thing we do. We do a lot of briefings. Uh, and we cover lots of topics even beyond Farm Bill topics. So while this is a five-part series about the Farm Bill, we've also recently covered Department of Energy's nuclear energy programs, Office of Energy Efficiency and, uh, and Renewable Energy programs. We did a four-part Congressional Climate Camp series earlier this year. We looked at public polling about climate change. We talked about non-CO2 greenhouse gas emissions and other pollutants, the budget and appropriations process, so not just substance, also process, uh, and then also the fourth briefing in that series was the implementation status of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act and Inflation Reduction Act. Um, this will be our last briefing for a little while, but we'll be back on July uh, 18th on the ninth floor of the Hart Building for our uh, Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. That is going to be an all-star series of panels. We're also going to have a fun reception after the event, so I encourage everyone, if you haven't already, to sign up for that. And with everything we do, um, the best way to keep up and sign up for our programming and things like that is to subscribe to our bi-weekly newsletter, which is called Climate Change Solutions. And you can do that by visiting us um, on our, uh, visiting our website at www.esi.org. Our programming is really designed for the congressional staff person. We know what it's like when it's, you know, four o'clock on a Thursday and the boss stops by and wants to know, hey, tell me all about conservation programs in the Farm Bill. And you're like, I have a dinner reservation at six, okay. ESI has those resources to help you answer those questions. We, we pride ourselves on being timely, relevant, accessible, and practical. Uh, and our resources come in all shapes and sizes. We do briefings. We also do a lot of writing. We do a lot of articles, for example. We do fact sheets. We just released a fact sheet a couple weeks ago about heavy-duty electric vehicles. It's a, real, it's a must read. We just posted one today about the Renew America's Nonprofit Program, which was enacted as part of the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. We do side-by-side-by-side -by -side -by -side comparisons of, uh, eventually, when we get House and Senate marks of the Farm Bill, we'll compare that with existing law to help you compare not just what the two chambers are proposing to do, but also how those compare to each other. We do a lot of issue briefs. If you haven't read our sustainable aviation emissions, or sustainable aviation fuel, aviation emissions uh, issue brief. That's one of our most popular resources. So pretty much, if your boss comes to you and has a question about a climate change topics, I would go dollars to donuts that we have a resource from the last year or two that will help you answer those questions and do it in a nonpartisan, science-based way. Um, if you like what you're seeing, uh, visit us online. All of our resources are free and available. Uh, if you visit us. Uh, and my colleagues and I, we're all wearing our little lapel pins. And so if you have questions that we don't, uh, you know, whether it's conservation topics or other things, catch up with me and Molly and Nicole and others. We'll all be hanging out after the briefing and we'd love to get to know you and learn a little bit more about your interests and your boss's priorities. The conservation title of the Farm Bill is what brings us here today. And that's because it contains important programs and policies that help agricultural producers, forest managers, and rural communities take advantage of opportunities to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and build resilience to climate impacts. And um, that happens while also generating other benefits. For example, uh, improved water and air quality, soil health, biodiversity, and jobs. Conservation of public, private, working, and non-working lands can take many forms, from regenerative agricultural practices to conservation easements. And our all-star panel today will help everyone understand what that looks like in practice uh, and some things that you might be thinking about as uh, House and Senate start to really get to work. Uh, on putting pen to paper on the Farm Bill. But before we get to our panelists, we're joined today by two special guests via pre-recorded introductions. Um, the first is Representative Nancy Mace. 
Representative Mace represents the first district of South Carolina in the US House of Representatives. She grew up in Goose Creek and earned accolades as one of the most fiscally conservative members of the South Carolina General Assembly and one of the most pro-conservation lawmakers in the state. Representative Mace was the first woman to graduate from the Citadel, which is the Military College of South Carolina in 1999 and earned magna cum laude honors. She also started her own business and brings extensive experience in technology, public relations and marketing and commercial real estate to her service in the house. So my colleague Dano will get the video up and running and we'll hear what Representative Mace has to say. Hey everyone, hey everyone, this is Congresswoman Nancy Mace from South Carolina's first congressional district. Got a little South Carolina flag right there. I wanna welcome everyone to the EESI briefing uh, where the convergence of energy and environment really are paramount uh, to our nation's future as a, as a conservationist and as a conservative and as someone who represents the coast of South Carolina, I recognize how important it is um, in terms of energy efforts, green energy efforts, all the above approach, protecting our environment. These things are so important to our way of life and our future. We appreciate your expertise, your knowledge, your subject matter, um, policy ideas, et cetera. Our door is always open. We're willing to work with anyone who's willing to work with us on these issues that all of us in the room today care about. I wish I could join you, maybe next time. Thanks to Representative Mace for joining us and to her great staff for making her participation possible. That brings us to our second special guest, Representative Sharice Davids. Representative Davids represents the third district of Kansas in the House. Uh, when she was sworn into the 116th Congress, Representative Davids became one of the first Native American women to serve in Congress. She studied at Johnson County Community College in the University of Missouri, Kansas City, before earning a law degree from Cornell Law School. And a special relevance to our briefing today, Representative Davids is a member of the House Agriculture Committee Subcommittee on Conservation, Research, and Biotechnology. Hi everyone, it's great Hi to be everyone. It's great to be with you today. Thanks to the Environmental and Energy Study Institute for inviting me to share a few words with you. Uh, for folks who I haven't met yet, my name is Sharice Davids and I represent Kansas's third district in Congress. Uh, I also serve as a member on the House Agriculture Committee. Look, I, uh, my understanding is this is the last conversation in the Farm Bill Briefing Series and I hope this has been an informative time for you all. You know, that mindset of learning and listening is exactly the approach that I've uh, taken over the past year to prepare for the upcoming Farm Bill reauthorization. Uh, I've had the chance to travel my district in Kansas on a Farm Bill listening tour, and uh, I don't have enough time to mention all the fun and amazing stops, but some have included uh, a meat and poultry farm, uh, a co-op, a no-till farm, a small family-owned farm, a livestock auction, just so many things. And uh, many of the agriculture professionals that I've spoken to uh, mention the need for us to protect our lands so that future farmers and producers can support their businesses and families, as well as our economy for generations to come. And um, that includes combating uh, climate change and extreme weather events like flooding and drought, which can devastate our agricultural community uh, in Kansas and, and across the country. You know, conservation programs administered by the U.S. Department of Agriculture have proven instrumental in achieving this goal. Uh, this includes the Conservation Reserve Program and the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, uh, which gives farmers and producers the tools to mitigate the effects of climate change uh, in their communities and to ensure that they can continue to feed the world. Can continue to feed the world. <laughs> Uh, you yeah, know, these programs empower agriculture professionals who know their land best. Um, it empowers them to protect and care for it. And as a member of the subcommittee on conservation research and biotechnology, I'm glad that we can talk about the benefits of these programs and, and, how, and how we can continue improving them moving forward. You know, the conservation title has long enjoyed bipartisan support. And I'm really glad to share this space today with my colleague, uh, Congresswoman Mace as we work to ensure that programs that support farmers and protect our lands are funded adequately and, and managed effectively through the 2023 Farm Bill. 
So thank you again for your time, and I hope you enjoy the rest of today's session, and I'll look forward to talking to you all soon. Tight squeeze back here. Sorry, panelists. You've, you've drawn the short end of the, of the stage today, <laughs> short straw. Um, while my colleague Dano puts the slides back up, uh, one last piece of housekeeping, and that is, uh, after we hear presentations from our four panelists today, we'll have an opportunity for questions and answers. And so everyone in the room will have an opportunity uh, to um, ask questions uh, about conservation programs in the Farm Bill and related subjects. Uh, but we'll also have an opportunity for our online audience to ask us questions. And so if you're in our online audience today, uh, you can send us an email. The email address to use is ask, that's A-S-K, at eesi.org. You can also follow us on social media at EESI Online, and we'll do our best to incorporate those questions uh, into the discussion. That brings us to our first panelist today. Samantha Levy leads the development and implementation of the American Farmland Trust's climate policy agenda. She leads the trust's efforts to advance adoption of new regenerative practices on farmland, protect farmland from development, and encourage smart renewable energy siting on farms. She also works closely with the Farmers Combat Climate Change Initiative, which elevates the role of farmers to adapt to and mitigate the effects of climate change. In 2020, Samantha was appointed to serve as a member of the New York Agriculture and Forestry Advisory Panel to the Climate Action Council to develop recommendations to reduce agricultural greenhouse gas emissions and increase carbon sequestration in soils. And she's also served as a member of the Governor's Racial Equity and Diversity in Agriculture Workgroup. Samantha, welcome to the lectern. I will turn the clicker over to you, and I'm really looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Dan. Am I good on sound? This is all I need? OK, great. Great. Uh, thank you for having me. Thank you, EESI, for having me. Thank you all for coming and spending your time here this afternoon. Uh, just to help me get a sense of who's in the room, how many of y'all work for a House member? Great. Senator? NGO? Excellent. Farm group? <laughs> cool. <laughs> OK. Thanks. Um, so uh, Dan already did a great job of uh, talking about what I work on. My portfolio covers soil health, conservation, solar siting, renewable energy siting on farms. So in case you're hearing about that from constituents, um, that's what I work on for our federal team. And I support our state and regional staff at AFT in doing so as well. For those who aren't familiar with American Farmland Trust, this is us. No farms, no food stickers, uh, that represents our mission. Our mission is to save the land that sustains us. Please take a stack of stickers on your way out. I brought enough for everyone. Our th uh, to accomplish this mission, we do it in three ways. By working to protect farmland, promote sound farming practices, and keep farmers on the land. And uh, we work, we've got a, an office in DC. We have state and regional offices throughout the country, probably in many of the places that you represent. And we work directly with farmers and ranchers. And we also work on policy at the local, state, and federal level. We often say we work from kitchen table to Congress. And I'm part of a federal team of five. Our Farm Bill work encompasses what I'll talk to you about today, but also the Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, land access for a new generation of farmers, business technical assistance, farm viability, and smart solar. And I left some resources on the front table about that. But like I said, I'm going to focus on sound farming practices. And I've been asked to give a 101, what they are, why they matter, and the programs that support them. And then I can't help myself talking about the Farm Bill, given where we are in the time of year. So first, what is soil health? How many folks are familiar with soil health? Definition practices, great. Well, then I'm glad I included this slide. So the definition of soil health from the Natural Resources Conservation Service at USDA or NRCS is the ability of soil to function as a living ecosystem that supports plants, animals, and humans. And then here, this very large graphic from NRCS as well depicts the four principles that farmers and ranchers may follow to improve their soil health. So that's maximizing biodiversity, that can look like integrating animals into crop production or diversifying crop rotation, growing more crops, reducing disturbance, so that can look like no-till, um, as Congresswoman Davids mentioned, or reduced tillage, maximizing cover, like planting cover crops in the off-season in between cash crops, maximizing living roots, 
like planting cover crops or planting perennials. So there's your soil health 101. Why does soil health matter? So many benefits from soil health to the farmers, to communities, and uh, to the taxpayer as well. And I'll talk about each of these in turn. So top graphic you see here is from AFT's soil health case studies. ESI has resources which will link you to these on the website. Uh, we found that over time, investment in soil health practices can generate a three to one return on investment for producers. It can take a few years to find that benefit, that return on investment, but it's quite good as you can see. There was also a 2021 study that showed under extreme drought conditions that a 1% increase in soil organic matter, which is a chief soil health indicator, can increase yields under those drought conditions by 33 bushels. So soil health practices promote resilience. How many of you are seeing more extreme weather across the country? Right, I see a lot of head nodding, a lot of hands going up. Under drought and flood conditions, these practices are super important for helping build resilience on a farm or ranch and to stabilizing yields in, under those conditions. Co-benefits for communities, improved water quality, reduced soil erosion on the farm keeps it out of our, our rivers and our waterways. Flood mitigation, same reason, water infiltration into the soils keeps it away from impervious surfaces and communities. And increased carbon sequestration, to help fight climate change, literally drawing carbon from the air into the soil. And I mentioned taxpayers. I'm sure many of your bosses care about taxpayer dollars. In 2019, the Economic Research Service at USDA came out with a study that looked at the expected cost increases to crop insurance from climate change and extreme weather, and they found that under a business as usual scenario, expectations for those costs to increase by 37% this century. But if farmers adopt adaptation practices, such as soil health practices, it could go down significantly to only as much as 22%. So these are really important for a lot of different reasons. But they're not very widely adopted. For example, as of 2017, only 6% of eligible acres that could have been planted with cover crops were leaving 94% of acres bare in the off season. Why is that? Farmers are working really hard to feed their families, to feed their communities, and they face a lot of important barriers that need to be overcome to changing from tried and true methods and adopting new practices and management systems. Chief of which cost, cost of new equipment, cost of seed, cost in time, figuring out how to do things, risk, perceived or real risk of yield loss, information gaps and barriers. What do I do? How do I know how to do it? No access to the right information or lack of knowing where to look. Cultural barriers, so it may just not be what has been done, though I will acknowledge there are many producers that have been doing, that have been practicing these practices for centuries even. And then insecure land tenure. I mentioned that sometimes it can take time for these practices to pay off. How many of you rent or have rented in your, in your lives? You're less apt to invest in improvements if you're renting, right, versus if you're owning, because it's not gonna really benefit you per se over the long term. And so insecure land tenure is important to address as well. What we're here to talk about today, there are programs that are out there to address so many of these barriers. And I'm gonna talk about NRCS programs today. Conservation Reserve Program. This is administered by the Farm Service Agency, or FSA. This is a um, term uh, retirement program that provides farmers with rental payments if they were to enter into a CRP contract for a length of time. The rest of these are administered by NRCS. So you've got the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, which invests in shorter term contracts to address identified resource concerns on the farm. Then you've got the Conservation Stewardship Program, which is kind of like the next level, graduation step two. Um, this invests in longer term contracts, perhaps around five years, to invest in maintaining those practices and adding new enhancements. The ASEP Program, Agricultural Conservation Easement Program, which my colleague Chris Coffin works on, invests in permanently protecting farmland. This also can help with farmland affordability and access. And then the Regional Conservation Partnership Program, which invests in regional or watershed scale um, 
projects that are proposed by RCPP folks who apply to the program um, to implement conservation on a regional scale and maybe in more innovative ways. That's the ideal um, for the program. This pie chart gives you an idea of the funding, relative funding for each of these programs in the last farm bill. So you can see CRP was about a third and same with EQIP, about a third of all the funding that went to these programs, uh, CSP about a quarter, and then a smaller share for RCPP and for ASEP. And for EQIP and CSP in particular, producers to gain access to that financial assistance to overcome those cost barriers, they need to work with somebody who is qualified to provide them with technical assistance. So that could be an NRCS staff person, could be someone else that NRCS has entered into agreement with, AFT has some of those planners on staff, and they work with the producer directly to identify what are the resource concerns that you wanna work on, what practices that NRCS supports funding for can we invest in, and then helps them find financial assistance for those. Hopefully everybody's clear on the 101. So um, back last year, AFT uh, held farm bill workshops with farmers and ranchers across the country, with service providers, researchers, and others. And we learned a little bit about what's working really well and what, where we have opportunities for improvement for these programs. And so I've uh, written a white paper with my colleagues and we just released this last week. I have a few copies in writing here if folks wanna grab them after, but also available um, from EESI by link. And at a very high level, these are locally led, locally implemented programs with well vetted science based standards. So if you wanna practice no-till, there are science based ways that they have identified for you to do that. But on the needs for improvement, they're highly oversubscribed, a lot more demand than funding available, and perhaps even more demand for technical assistance than agents available. Lengthy application processes farmers have reported facing, gaps in support, whether it be by production type or region, some equity challenges. We heard a lot from small scale producers, small operations that they struggle to access this assistance. And there, there's some limited room to invest in innovation because they're supporting the really tried and true practices with the exception of RCPP and conservation innovation grants within the EQIP program. For example, between 2010 and 2020, only 30% of EQIP applications were able to be funded. So less than a third. And there was also a study released in 2020 that showed that uh, between 2009 and 2018, only 17 to 27% of uh, funding from EQIP went towards soil health practices. So they're investing in a lot of different resource concerns. So just a small share of the overall pot there. We have developed some goals, recommendations that I'll just touch on briefly. You can find more information in our white papers um, and those, like I said, those links are available from EESI. And our goals in this arena are to support producers in increasing long-term adoption of conservation practices that will improve soil health, address climate change, build resilience, uh, to make NRCS programs more accessible and equitably available and to benefit or to build, sorry, farmer to farmer learning networks. And I'll say a little bit more about that. So first on our checklist, providing sustainably increased funding to meet farmer demand for conservation, financial and technical assistance. The Inflation Reduction Act injected a lot of funding into these programs, but that funding sunsets in 2026. So, you know, solving the longer term, how do we meet the funding demand problem? hopefully something we can do this farm bill and streamlining program implementation. And like I said, you can find more on this here. <laughs> oh, there's some uh, animation. <laughs> okay, so increasing support for farmer to farmer learning. We see this as kind of the missing piece. We're investing in technical assistance and financial assistance. It helps with cost barriers. This can help with information barriers, cultural barriers, it can even help with land tenure. Farmer to farmer learning is so critical to this conversation. It really helps to overcome the adoption barriers by having someone with first hand experience address perceived risks to yield and more that may prevent a farmer from trying a new practice. It's as much about what doesn't work as what does. This is already happening. 
organically across the country, informally, formally in coffee shops, et cetera, in, in the field. According to a survey that we did in New England, over 50% of farmers that we surveyed were learning about conservation from other farmers. And that's something we hear across the country. Ask any farmer or rancher, where do you learn about conservation? Nine times out of 10, first thing they'll say is another farmer. So we have a proposal to build this into the farm bill. There's more information on the front table or I can provide it. Creating a program that provides matching funds for state and tribal soil health programs. So there are innovations happening. There are locally led programs being developed at the state level. I can, we have another white paper on that that gives you tons of examples of that. We've done a webinar as well. You can find more information on that or just ask me. Creating a program in the Farm Bill to match those funds, to augment them, helps to augment innovation for locally led programs, build off of NRCS programs, and to fill gaps. For example, many states invest in equipment purchase for soil health practice adoption, and that's a really big key barrier. Oh, and I should also mention there are a couple of bills. The Agriculture Resilience Act includes this in the bill, and there was a bill introduced last week by representatives Gallagher, Nunn, and Huffman uh, called the No Emits Act that includes a proposal for this, and the ARA was introduced by Senator Heinrich and Representative Pingree, amongst others. And you can see on this memo just incredibly broad support. Ooh, I have a little pointer. Incredibly broad support for this across the country. Finally, I mentioned we heard small scale operations struggle to access some of these programs. So we've been working with Senator Booker, representatives, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my card, um, but I can remember, representatives uh, Strickland, Adams, and McGovern to introduce a bill which was introduced recently, the Office of Small Farms Establishment Act, that would basically look through USDA program policies and make sure that small scale producers are able to access not just conservation programs, but all of the services that USDA provides. And so I encourage you to keep in touch. This is my contact information. You can look on our website for all these resources. And like I said, some of them are available through EESI. We're also working on crop insurance and conservation. Happy to talk about that. And like I said, ASAP, land access, business technical assistance, and solar. And thank you so much. Thank you, Samantha. You're welcome for your fabulous presentation. And if anyone would like to revisit that fabulous presentation, I have two suggestions. One would be to go to ESI.org and download all of the great materials and presentation materials that Samantha just presented and referred to. You could also watch the archived webcast. It will be up in a few days. So if you want to go back and revisit anything that Samantha just said or anything that our other panelists are about to say, um, that resource is available to you, uh, including the, the white paper that you, that you mentioned. Um, our second panelist today is Eileen Shader. Eileen is the director of River Restoration in American Rivers. In 2015, she relocated to her home state of Pennsylvania, where she leads American Rivers' National Floodplain, Floodplain Restoration Program. Eileen spent most of her career at American Rivers advocating to Congress and the federal government to support sound floodplain management policies. Prior to joining American Rivers, she held positions at the National Wildlife Federation, the National Environmental Trust, and US EPA. Eileen is a certified floodplain manager and works to reconnect rivers to their floodplains and restore natural floodplain habitats. Eileen, the clicker is yours. Take it away. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. There we go. Um, thank you very much for having me and really appreciate the opportunity uh, to participate in this briefing and talk about uh, the Farm Bill and uh, conservation practices. So um, today I'm going to focus on um, a program that is uh, technically an emergency uh, protection program under the um, NRCS, um, but in reality is a conservation program um, and how it is applied. So. Um, if you're not familiar with American Rivers, we are a premier national river conservation organization that works to protect wild rivers, restore damaged rivers, and conserve clean water for people in nature. Um, and as Dan mentioned, I lead our national floodplain restoration program, uh, which is uh, focused on working with partners and communities across the country 
uh, to implement nature-based, equitable, um, and multi-benefit floodplain management pro uh, programs um, and projects. So that can include anything from, um, we have staff working directly on the ground to uh, reconnect rivers to their floodplains, restore natural habitat, um, to working at uh, advancing state level programs that support multi-benefit projects that both reduce flood risk and um, restore habitat for floodplain dependent species and working on federal uh, policy initiatives like the Farm Bill and Water Resources Development Act and National Flood Insurance Program. But today we're gonna talk about uh, floodplain easements under the NRCS. Um, my colleague, um, Olivia Dorothy, who uh, lives in Illinois and leads our Mississippi River Program, uh, wasn't able to be here today, um, but she led uh, the effort to produce a report um, on the multiple benefits of floodplain easements that looked at their use within the upper Midwest states, um, the upper Mississippi, and then um, assessed how floodplain easements are utilized and how um, some of the challenges with that program. So um, if you are, well, one thing I would say about the, if you're not familiar with the floodplain easement program, um, essentially, it works where uh, the NRCS will put um, their voluntary program, will put an easement on uh, flood prone land, um, agricultural land, um, and then the landowner uh, um, enters an agreement with the NRCS to restore that land to more natural conditions. So we're restoring the hydrology so that the water um, is able to soak into the ground, we're restoring natural habitat and native vegetation in order to improve the capacity of that, um, that land to provide benefits to society. Uh, when we talk about floodplains, I know many people think about a, a floodplain as the 100 year uh, as floodplain as defined by the National Flood Insurance Program and where you might need insurance. Um, but for our purposes, we're talking about it more as an ecosystem or a landscape. So the land next to rivers and water bodies, that gets flooded on a regular basis. And uh, some people think that floodplains are interchangeable with wetlands. And that's not quite correct. Uh, you can have wetlands on a floodplain, but not all floodplains are wetlands. Floodplains tend to have much more diverse ecosystems. Um, there will be some standing water. There may be some side channels and streams. There may be some um, areas of high elevation um, with different kinds of trees and, and native vegetation. And one of the most amazing things about floodplains is that many of our wildlife and fish and birds are evolved to exist on a floodplain. Some part of their life cycle depends on access to a floodplain in order for them to thrive. So they're really, really undervalued or underappreciated, I should say, ecosystem within our, um, within our nation and the world. Um, and one of the great things about floodplains is they provide so many different benefits to society when they, especially when they're in their natural condition. Um, they are able to sequester carbon into deep root systems of native uh, species, or native plant species. Um, they help to clean and capture um, ca or clean water by capturing excess nutrients, of nitrogen and phosphorus, and and these these. Uh, uh, pollutants that we're trying so hard to try and manage within many of our uh, agricultural waterways. Um, and they're really amazing places for fish and wildlife, which then produce recreational opportunities, um, which are economic drivers for many communities. So what made us start looking at floodplain easements as a, a program that maybe needed um, some improvements? Um, so our interest really was sparked by um, this one incident in um, Dogtooth Bend, which is uh, in southern Illinois. It's an um, uh, area, this is the Mississippi River uh, flowing down here. Um, and this is a very heavy agricultural area. Um, this levee district, I believe, is about 17,000 acres uh, farmed in corn, corn and soybeans and they experience regular flooding. It's, a, it's protected by a levee, and we saw levee breaches just happening over and over at this place. In short, because the Mississippi River wants to cut through there. Um, so it was a place where the, the river wants to go where it wants to go, and it's gonna take out that levee. Um, and it did, multiple times. 
In 2016, um, the Army Corps of Engineers decided that they weren't going to rebuild that levee anymore. Um, it was just not economically feasible to continue doing this, um, and that they needed a new approach. So for the farmers that are left in this area, um, what can they do with their land? What options do they have? So many of them started looking at conservation programs, and could they put this land into permanent conservation since they just weren't going to be able to farm it anymore? I mean, this is uh, part of this area after repetitive flooding. I mean, it's just like sand dunes. There's just all sorts of material <laughs> deposited all over the place. And well, that's not a wetland. It doesn't qualify for wetland conservation programs. So what else can they do? Um, so we started looking at floodplain easements. Um, but the challenge is that uh, there was no money in the floodplain easement program that was available for them. So some farmers started applying um, and were told that there wasn't an opportunity right then. Part of the challenge is that uh, the way that this program operates as an emergency program is that uh, funding is only appropriated and goes into the program when there's sort of a major disaster declared. So when there's like a Stafford Act declaration, if anybody's aware of how that works. Um, and if there's no disaster declared, there's no money put into the program. So even if farmers apply, they're not going to be able to access the funding. Um, when we looked at the Upper Mississippi River states, uh, we found that over the last decade, even though there was over 2,500 agricultural disasters, so in these rural areas, there was uh, flooding disasters, only one time had there been uh, funding allocated to the floodplain easement program. When we looked a little deeper, and I'm going to throw a couple of different uh, graphs at you, but looked a little deeper at the data, one of the things we saw was that um, the enrollment of floodplain easements within this program over the years were pretty low. Um, so, uh, you know, a couple of years where we had uh, funding allocated and a decent number of floodplain easements um, enrolled, for the most part, I mean, we're looking at under 50 easements being uh, implemented every year, and this is across the country for these numbers. When you compare that to the number of agricultural disasters that are declared in counties in agricultural areas, it's a very small amount of easements that are available in these areas that are being flooded, um, particularly ones that are flooded regularly. So one question that folks ask then is, well, if people aren't getting easements, is it because there's not demand? Um, and that's not accurate. Um, there's definite demand. When you look at the number of um, uh, farmers that have applied to put their their land into floodplain easements, um, there's a significant unmet demand. And this doesn't just apply to the um, upper Mississippi states. If uh, We've pulled some preliminary numbers from um, all states across the country, and um, these track that there's always a significant amount of applications and just not enough money and availability to go around. So there are just definitely a number of farmers around the country who do, these are farmers who just don't want to deal with their land flooding over and over and over. Um, so it's, it, we're talking about farmers that voluntarily want to put their land into to a better use rather than just continue to farm and then get crop insurance payouts every couple of years. Um, can't see this one up here, but um, just a couple of other things, um, points I wanted to make is that flooding is continuing to increase. We all know this, um, getting more severe, um, and the costs associated with flooding and repetitive flooding continue to increase due to climate change. I think this is a point hopefully we're all well aware of. And when that happens, that also means that our payouts for things like crop insurance and the damages to um, crops is going to continue to increase um, as the years move on. Um, within the Upper Mississippi River, um, we've seen that uh, the producers are particularly hit by flooding. Um, we're talking damages and, and um, payouts in the um, billions of dollars for many of our, our most heavily agricultural states. 
Um, and this then applies to the cost to taxpayers across the nation um, in terms of uh, how much is being paid out in crop insurance um, and in the funding for uh, responding to floods and responding to disasters every year. But when we're talking about the floodplain easement program, it's not just about cost, um, although that's certainly one reason to um, be interested in this. Um, for American rivers, we are, of course, interested in conserving and restoring more natural floodplains for those benefits that can provide to society. So just a couple to touch on. Um, wetlands, in particular, um, are incredibly effective at helping to uh, store water, convey floodwaters, slow down how the water is moving through a watershed. The more wetlands you have within a watershed, the slower your floodwaters will move downstream and it will help reduce the damages to communities and to infrastructure downstream. Uh, I mentioned nutrient pollution before. Um, many of our conservation um, programs don't count floodplain restoration as a best management practice, even though much of the, um, the scientific uh, literature demonstrates that they do an incredible job at capturing uh, nitrogen and phosphorus and helping us reduce our, um, or improve our water quality. Um, and these, the orange ones up there is floodplain restoration compared to many of the other best management practices. And then um, I mentioned before uh, floodplains as being really key in helping uh, with biodiversity and restoring and protecting some of our most vulnerable species. Um, I mentioned before that some of our, our species are really floodplain dependent. When um, there's some really amazing research that's been done where um, endangered, many endangered fish send their, their um, spend part of their life on a floodplain um, at key times. And that's really important because it's slower water, it's much more, um, there's more food, there's much more shelter, and that can help them to grow faster and thrive. And having access to floodplains within our watersheds where we have a lot of endangered species can be a really important um, aspect to help with that recovery of those different species. So one of the things that American Rivers has been doing is talking um, with different offices about the opportunities to try and um, enhance the use of the floodplain easements program. Um, a couple of uh, key um, areas where we see an opportunity. One is to figure out how to get this program funded on an annual basis. So it's not gonna be just um, dependent on having um, Congress allocate funding when there's a major disaster declared. Um, we need to get money into this program annually so that it's available when, when farmers need it. Um, second would be making sure that farmers have an opportunity every year to enroll. Um, as we've seen, there's unmet, um, unmet need and uh, uh, opportunity to have um, the farmers that need it in any particular year be able to access and apply um, can help us uh, help them address their needs of how they need to manage their land. Um, and a third idea is uh, to really be able to focus on some of the most repetitive flooded properties. So the ones that um, are, are experiencing some of the most repetitive payouts in crop insurance or experiencing the most investment um, in terms of emergency response funding. Um, those are easy opportunities to be able to adapt to climate change and ensure that we are um, investing our funds um, appropriately while having an opportunity to protect and restore the land around them. So, um, that is about it. Um, I have uh, our reports that we published on this. Uh, we have some copies out on the front desk um, and we're happy to take any questions. Thank you. That was great. I just wanted to stand up rather than sit down, and I'm glad I did because that catfish photo, I think if I had been sitting in the front row, I would have, yeah. I would have shrieked a little bit. That's a big catfish photo. Um, as a quick reminder, um, we have some questions coming in from our online audience. So if you're in our online audience and you have a question, you can send us an email. The email address to use is ask, uh, that's ASK at ESI.org. And of course, for folks in the room, we'll, have a, uh, we'll be able to take questions after our fourth panelist today. Our third panelist, however, is Paula Yvette Bonija Carrero. Uh, she is with us today on behalf of the Hispanic Access Foundation's Latino Climate Council, and she's a licensed agronomist with a focus in animal behavior and welfare. 
She explores the socioeconomic limitations to achieving food security and how those issues can be addressed through community engagement, agriculture extension programs, and education. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Hello to all, and thank you for being here today. My name is Paola Bonilla Carrero. As I mentioned, I'm an agronomist, an animal scientist, and an educator from Aguadilla, Puerto Rico. My areas of interest are integrating social equity, food accessibility, and creating agriculture engagement and extension by creating better connection with the farmers and producers and the communities they serve. I have, wait, let me, let me put my presentation real quick. Um, perfect, awesome. So I have been a part of academia and I have also engaged in public policy, but most importantly, I've been part, I've been working in the field as an agronomist, both in areas of the DMV and in Puerto Rico. And something that I realized in both situ situations is that there is a clear gap between the efforts that academia and public policy do towards the improvement of agriculture versus how that is translated into the producers and the farmers. It is crucial to reduce these gaps because and visibilize the issues that these producers and farmers point forward because at the end of the day, thanks to them, we have food on our table. So that's what I'm gonna be talking about today. I'm gonna to be focusing on productions and farm agroecological projects in Puerto Rico and how they have um, implemented conservation practices. Before I begin, I wanna thank all the farmers and producers who took the time to have these conversations with me, as well as team members of the USDA um, Caribbean Climate Hub and the Institute of Agroecology. Thanks to them, I have this presentation. So there is no clear definition of agroecology, but rather a set of disciplines and knowledge that and how they're integrated. Agroecology takes ecological concepts and applies them into farming. It is a global movement that emphasizes um, ancestral and campesino knowledge, and it's honored and applied. And it breaks away from the industrialized, industrialized paradigm where there's a hierarchy of who the experts are. It's basically a multifactorial approach and inclusive approach to the way we produce food. Agroecology um, it's, um, prioritizes long-term economic viability by ensuring that all parts of the economic production of food is considered, whether it's marketing, technology, distribution, and accessibility. It also prioritizes conservation by protecting and regeneration, regenerating our natural resources. It looks for technical and, and technical ways to use our energy more practically. And also, it tries to stem away from external inputs. Agroecology all the, and centers around social equity because it promotes dignified salaries for the workers. It centers on uplift previously marginalized communities like black indigenous people of color who are farmers and producers and aims towards food sovereignty, which is not the same as food security. Food sovereignty is a fundamental right for everybody, everybody to have accurate, adequate, culturally appropriate, affordable, and healthy food. And it centers the people as the decision makers for their agricultural systems and their food. I'm sorry, I move a lot, so I'm gonna try to work on that. So there are multiple conservation practices. I cannot name all of them. So I'm gonna focus on the ones that the farms that I will be talking about focuses. So agroecology mimics natural ecosystem and that way they have more resilient and diverse systems. They diversify the crops and by adding local native plants and cover crops, which usually are deep rooted perennials that provide structure, integrity, and nutrients to the soil. By diversifying these crops, they build stronger um, lands that, that differentiate from monocropping, the things that we usually see in industrial agriculture. And monocropping makes plants vulnerable and more dependent on external inputs like herbicides, plaguicides, and synthetic fertilizer. Contrast to industrial agriculture, agroecology uses organic matter as a natural fertilizer of the soil. Adequate water management is crucial for agroecology as we are facing a very real water crisis. It focuses on reducing water waste, reducing soil erosion, and also preparing the land for inclement weathers, like mentioned before, of floods and droughts. 
And lastly, the reintegration of livestock is crucial for agroecology, given that we do need to follow the thought of more crops, less land, more outputs, less land. So now I'm going to take the opportunity and talk and highlight some of the projects that are happening in Puerto Rico. These projects are usually small scale and family projects, so I want to point that out as well. So I am working with these, this farm right now. It's called Finca El Timón in Lares. It's a family operated farm that practices sustainable agriculture by integrating animal husbandry and vegetable farming. Their main purpose and focus is the reintegration of livestock, particularly this native cattle breed called the India Criolla. This breed is adapted to the tropical climate, but it's also a dual purpose breed where the cattle is used for milk, which they produce cheese and merchandise it, as well as the oxen is used for plowing or tillage of the land. This is much more less aggressive than heavy machinery, is cost effective, and the oxen are fertilizing the soil with their manure as they walk. So other than this um, cattle breed, they also integrate a variety of crops, they do um, graze rotations so the, the land doesn't saturate. They do conscious tree clearing for, to promote native trees and practice silver pasture. They also have other types of husbandry like cattle, like goats, chickens, and turkeys. And they're also part of the making of compost, which then they in fact use from crop harvesting. So it's a cyclical practice that they do. And their mission is to protect this cattle breed, promote the oxen plowing, which is a cultural practice that has been lost and stem away from heavy machinery use. This other farm is called Finca Plenitud in Las Marias. It's a nonprofit educational project. They have a mul multiple conservation practices from permaculture to bioconstruction, but they have a really smart water management system because they're in the mountainous area. And we know that mountainous area, when there's heavy rainfall, water falls with a lot of ener uh, energy. So they follow the soil and barns approach as well as counter farming. A swale is basically a grassland depression that allows the water to pass through and dissipates its energy and it prevents runoff when, the, when there's heavy rain. The barns are land earth walls that are close to the ditch and they are in charge of retaining that water and allowing to infiltrate the soil. This in addition to counter farming which is basically preparing terrace or plowing the land in a way that follows the natural landscape and, and slopes. This reduces erosion, it makes it easier to work in the land because you're following the, the landscape, and integrated is a passive water management tool that should be implemented in many other places that have the issue with droughts and flooding. So now I'm gonna mention other farms that are specifically um, benefiting from the USDA conservation programs. So this Las Fincas in Rio Grande is a woman-owned agribusiness that is focused on the, the raising of cattle for meat. When they first acquired their land, it wasn't prepared for agriculture. But thank you, thankfully to the USDA NRCA conservation program, they have had the opportunity to begin the efforts to reach their goals. Some of the things, this is some of them, they, had, they received a couple of them, but one of them, some of them was the tree shrub site propagation program that allowed them to start planting trees to create shade and reduce heat stress in animals. Prescribed grazing, which basically is harvesting and maintaining healthy pastures while maintaining soil, healthy soils, and you do that while having grazing animals. Forage and biomass planting to improve pasture quality. The pasture that they had had low palatability and low nutritional value. So they're trying to create, to add native pastures that are better for the animals. Their beef, the beef production is a niche market in Puerto Rico and they center it in the protection of natural resources and focusing on animal well-being and creating good quality meat. So it's important to promote um, conscious agroecological animal production, not only crop production, because we need to eat, right? So the last one I'm going to talk about is the Proyecto Agroecológico El Josco Bravo in Toa Alta. They're pioneers in Puerto Rico for agroecological farming and education. They basically do all the practices that I've mentioned before, 
but most importantly, they have been classified as primer farmland by the NRCS program due to its soils with high fertility and excellent agroecological output. Less than 5% of the world have this classification. And I have to remind you how small Puerto Rico is, so that's really impressive. So the conservation and protection of this soil is crucial. They also produce over 21,000 pounds of food in 2021 in just a three acre land. So they serve as proof that sustainable agroecology can feed communities and it's done in a really small space. So the opportunities are endless. They also offer a um, agroecological promoter course, which I'm taking right now, which is an intensive theoretical and practical course that teaches all audience how to start a vegetable garden from scratch the principles of agroecology and the students work in different farms around the area. I feel that this type of courses should be implemented worldwide, whether you wanna have a project or not, because there is an urgency to shift our agriculture production and people, everybody eats. So the more people are aware of our situation, the larger scope we can impact. They've also benefited from NRCS conservation program. Although their farm, as you can see, is open, we do have variations in weather in Puerto Rico. We have an intense dry season and an intense rainy season. In rainy season, it's hard to produce. We have incidents of, of mold and plagues, and it just is hard to maintain. So thanks to the High Tuna Initiative, they were able to create a shaded structure with a waterproof roof that allow for stabilities in the crops and allowed for them to be able to produce even more types of, of crops that are that do not depend on the actual season while still practicing agroecological practices. So like everything, there are challenges. I'm first going to talk about the challenges in Puerto Rico and then talk about challenges in general. So we are currently going through a land access and land tenure crisis, like Sam mentioned. It is gentrification and displacement have spiked the prices of land, making it really inaccessible for the Puerto Ricans that live in the island. It is not feasible for everybody to put out a loan to buy a land because a, a farm is a high risk investment. So people are struggling to have tenure because it's not really feasible to, to rent a land that you're not promised that you're gonna see, receive your rewards. Also entities like the land of authorities don't really have an accurate census of the available land. So, and bureaucratic limitations really makes the process even more arduous and tedious. Secondly, and what we've been struggling for centuries are austerity measures like the Jones Act. We really limits the scope from which producers can compete at the market when we have second class, lower quality imported food in the supermarket that will not ever be able to compete with good quality organic produce that are the formal agricultures are doing. Also, it really limits and inhibits their opportunity to export their goods. Other issues are we need to increase the public policy to protect farmers from inclement weather and natural disasters. We need to update our curriculum in universities that are specialized in agriculture so we can have degrees that are specific for regenerative agriculture. Socioeconomic disparities and inaccessibilities have made processed food more common than fresh food. So that's another issue that we face as well that the, as the dwindling practice of eating seasonally. And lastly, and the reason why we're here, we need to expand how much we re the, the reach of agriculture farmers and, and incentivize them for the conservation practices. And this is because conservation farm practices involve many types of people and needs. There is a need for technical and educational assistance for farmers because not everybody has access to computer, social media, not everybody. And we shouldn't focus on the people that have that access to be able to implement. This is where agriculture extension comes into place. We have to focus our, we need to focus on small scale regional production. And to conclude, Intensive and conventional agriculture that we've seen for the last 60 years is not a viable production of food. It has proven that it's not capable of feeding our communities and has caused irreparable damage to our ecosystem. Now more than ever, we need to uplift the communities and the farmers that are doing, are feeding our communities, are working against food insecurity and food deserts while regenerating, regenerating our natural resources. Agroecology is not an idea, it is not a concept. 
it is an applicable and effective practice that can protect our natural resources and feed our world. Thank you. Thank you so much. There's nothing wrong with the with SR 188. It's a perfectly fine place for a briefing, but we might have to talk about maybe doing our briefings in Puerto Rico because the photos you displayed, it's kind of nice. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Those are great, great shots that you provide. Thank you. Um, we have our final panelist joining us now, and I'm really pleased to introduce Benet Kalik. Benet is an enrolled member of the Palma Band of Luiseno Indians and a proud, des proud descendant of the Wicol people of Jalisco, Jalisco, excuse me. Over the last 35 years, Benet has represented Indian country in various political, cultural, and administrative capacities. She has served as the repatriation chair since the age of 21, and her life's work is to preserve the culture and traditions of her people. Through various roles, Benet interacts with the youth, culture, public, and political relations of her tribe. She's established and served as board chair and president of Onopo Strategies, a multifaceted consultancy and holding company with capabilities in economic development, technology procurement, distribution, business strategy, marketing, and environmental and agricultural management. And for people who joined us a couple weeks ago at the Rural Development Briefing, Benet also introduced us to Duane, who stole the show along with Aaliyah and our other panelists. Uh, so thanks very much for that as well. Benet, welcome to the lectern. I'm looking forward to your presentation. Yeah, I'll go first. <laughs> So I'm, the, I'm the, the last person, which is a really hard position to be in, um, only because these women here did an amazing job. So, so I really appreciate that. Mio yam mechachun ikhun. No orong bnei kalak no pamangna. So um, what I just said was, hello, how are you? Um, and how are you? And that uh, my name is Benet Kalak, and I'm uh, from Palma. So I uh, born and raised on, well, wasn't born on reservation down the road, but pretty much raised uh, all my life on my reservation. Um, served tribal council for three terms. Um, was raised uh, on the reservation uh, in the mountains, in the in the in the uh, in our uh, river. Well, it's not river, it's a stream, I guess. But um, I, it was raised in a good way. So uh, I'm, I'm really honored to be here. I am a person who, you can ask me any question. I think sometimes, and for the people who do work with uh, Representative Sharice Davis, you probably um, have a, a, she's an amazing person. Uh, and anybody who's worked with uh, Deb Holland, um, uh, um, Honorable Deb Holland, she, I was, had the pleasure of meeting them prior to them being here. So even at that time, they were just so amazing. But I am the kind of person who wants to um, be asked any question that you think may not be politically correct or uh, uncomfortable. It does seem like sometimes as tribal people, we're still held under a glass um, that there's, that um, I'm still to this day get the question of, you know, uh, that we don't exist. So I'm really thankful and honored to be here, as well as I'm sure if you were here when Dwayne Sherman was giving his presentation, he definitely stole the show. So Onopo Strategies uh, is a company, uh, organization that helps tribes and outside organizations with tribal engagement. We, um, if you see here on the, on the screen, well, maybe it's not there now. So I, I just wanted to share a little bit about these photos. Um, that's actually a young girl from the um, Pine Ridge Indian Reservation. That's her horse. She's an amazing horse. Um, horse her horsemanship is amazing. But, um, you know, they obviously struggle with a lot of issues, and, and they are huge farmers, but they deal with a lot of water issues. Um, the picture of the basket is um, a basket of the world wind and it's in regards to perpetual motion and that our people believe in. And when it comes to our gathering rights, um, we have still difficulties to, the, to this day. So I wanted to be able to show you just a little bit about us as a people. I'm going to stay pretty close to my time, I think, 
And, and just FYI, um, being on tribal council, and I'm sure this is the way for you guys as well, we're always insured or when we provide a presentation or someone provides a presentation to us, uh, it's direct. Here's the information. Um, although I'm a little jealous because there were some really great pictures, I was like, man, I should add more pictures. But I did not. Uh, just really, I'm actually stepping back a little bit. Onapol Strategies also, we are the ambassadors of um, the nation of Hawaii. The nation of Hawaii is out of, out of Oahu, out of Hawaii Manolo. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of uh, people for the uh, nation of Hawaii, but this specific group is responsible for reestablishing their opuno. Uh, and they are total sovereign. Uh, so if you want more information on that, I can share that as well. So what I wanted to do is kind to kind of take you back because I always want to make sure that people understand the beginning. In order for you to learn um, how to walk, you had to start at the beginning. In order to learn, you had to start at the beginning. So that's extremely important for me. And it is amazing that a lot of people in regards to um, when they talk about manifest destiny, that's actually one of the first things that we as tribal people learn um, about manifest destiny. Not too many people really understand the definition to that. Um, my young daughter, my son, and my nieces and nephews understand manifest destiny. Um, and I won't go into the definitions, and, and please, if you guys get a chance, um, you'll really grasp a concept about our tribal people if you understand the different eras that I had gone through. And, um, and this is, it is, I'm going to tie it into the Farm Bill and conservation. So um, quickly after Manifest Destiny, there's discovery and conquest, treaty making. I, mean, you know, I don't have to read them to you, but the Removal and Relocation Act, that has a really huge effect on us in regards to um, taking action in, in farming. Because when you remove a people from a land and then you put them on a smaller one, they then have to create another way to address or their, and feed their families. And then we have a cultural tie. We have a cultural tie to the land. The land that we sit on is, tells a, a creation story of the people that were here. This was their beginning place. And so there's, there's a large, uh, and it, there's a disconnect. So for allotment and assimilation, that was, a, again, in a difficult time for us to try to re-engage back into, um, into farming, into agriculture, into supplying for our life and, and for our people. The Reorganization Act and self-government uh, was an opportunity for us to be able to reestablish who we are, although it didn't really um, happen that way. And then you suffered the Termination Act, the Termination Act where there were tribes where they were just no longer in existence. The United States government said, you're no longer a people. And um, so that was devastating. And, and then we came obviously to the Self-Determination Act and um, that is actually to the present time. So again, I'm, you know, I'm not going to go into details to them, but when we talk about the federal responsibility and the power of Indian affairs, we as tribes, and I'm sure many of you, raise a hand, how many of you met with tribal leaders or tribal staff? Uh, not too many, huh? So, um, although tribal leadership doesn't want to meet with staffers, they want to meet with, you know, the representatives, but I think it's extremely important that you do engage it's extremely important for you to engage with what is happening with the tribes. Um, so the federal government has a fiduciary responsibility to address tribes. And you know, I don't need to go into detail what you guys know about us as tribes, but. So um, the next page is, I wanted to give you guys a little bit of insight on, on um, our phases or just phases of engagement. Sorry, I'm gonna go on here. Here it is, these are my notes. <laughs> so um, I think that's probably one of the, the hardest things for the outside communities to understand. And this is in, our, this is in regards to um, a process and, and understanding the tribe's needs. 
especially around now that there's a there's a huge interest in, in tribes and conservation. It's not just an interest. You have DOI stating that we as tribes have a place and we need to be heard. So, um, and, and I don't know if any of you guys know in here that there are over, there's 574 tribes within the United States. Um, that doesn't mean that that includes all of them. Obviously, I'm not talking about the ones that have been terminated. So there are some states that don't have tribes, but that doesn't mean that there wasn't tribal land at one time. So when you engage with tribes, um, the phases of it, or I call it phases, but you know, tribes are um, tribes um, are key to the success success of conservation, and the efforts for the with the United States is is trying to establish. The reason why is we have um, we have we hold the knowledge, and it's not just the tribes here; it's the indigenous people. But we hold the knowledge of uh, traditional ecological knowledge. Um, I've heard tribal leaders say, "Well, if they would have listened to us, then that probably wouldn't happen. Right? The flooding probably wouldn't happened. The burns probably wouldn't happened. Um, you know, we would have had a lot more." to, you know, to, for, to sustain our, our people. And that's just not the people of the reservation, but that's the people of this United States. So, um, again, these are just suggestions. In, and I said it earlier, to initiate conversation among small groups, tribal leaders, tribal technical experts. But I can ensure that you understand that it is extremely important to talk to the right tribal person. Do not assume that Benet is here speaking for all of Indian country because I in no way can do that. Or am I even allowed to do that? So it's extremely important to find the proper one. And I know that's a little difficult because our world is pretty, um, can get a little crazy. But, um, you know, you have people like myself and I know you guys have talked to tribal people. And so I'm really excited that they did mention that. And, um, when you go into the next phase, so the first phase of that is engagement and hearing the stories of the people. The second phase would be, um, again, that we're important to conservation efforts into, oh, that's the same thing, isn't it? But it's feedback, right? I'm sorry, that's the same thing. I'm like, I think I copied and pasted the wrong thing. So I apologize, you guys. But I don't need that. Phase two is just comments and feedback. You want to be able to engage with tribes to hear what their story is. You want to have them tell you their issues. Um, how many of you in here know about tribal water rights? It's huge. That is going to be a game changer when it comes to the farm bill and conservation. That that I would um, do your do your studying on that because it's extremely important and they're all different for every every tribe. So um, uh, my tribe is, was in a 45-year water lawsuit against the federal government. We, there was five of us. Uh, the Saboba tribe, which is out in Southern California, they were in a 73-year uh, uh, yeah, lawsuit, which, um, again, uh, water rights is described that we as tribes would have that, but it was obviously taken from us. So in regards to like step three, and um, which is the next next steps, once you do engagement, once you do conversation, once you hear the story, and you build, um, you maybe collaboratively build policy, but you also implement what was what was established, and um, those are those are things that I've seen in being ex extremely successful in uh, conservation efforts, USDA, I know NRCS is everywhere and they're doing some amazing jobs. But again, out of the 574 tribes, maybe 20% of those tribes are seeing those efforts. And so again, my goal here today is to emphasize on uh, engagement, emphasize in learning your community um, and, and understanding that you don't have um, you may not have all the answers or you may not know who to go to, but I'd like to simply say is there's 50 states. There's 50 governors. There's 574 tribes. I'm pretty sure not all 574 tribes get to talk to 
whether it be the president or the Congress or the Senate. So it would be nice. But I can understand the difficulty of a program or a representative in, in wanting in needing to talk to individuals. Um, so oh, wrong one, sorry. Um, so the in in the past probably three years, I've been doing a lot of work in regards to national monuments, land conservations, um, different efforts in in uh, developing policies around that. Um, even most recently, a uh, discussion at the National Congress of American Indians on the Farm Bill and the need for water rights. But um, this is something I wanted to provide you guys kind of like as an insight, you know, to learn the purpose and the process of, of public lands and their efforts. You know, that's what should be either conveyed to the tribes or having an understanding of what the tribes are, how they're looking at it. And then another part is to learn from one another and learn from tribes what they see as opportunities to collaborate on protecting lands and other natural resources that are important to the tribe and to NGOs and USDA, um, USDA efforts and advocacy groups. And I mention that because the, um, as just most recently, we, when you talk about water rights and then you talk about lack of access of um, fishing or um, or uh, any any foods. One of the things that I think Sam had brought it up was oh no, it was um, Elaine. Elaine is that correct? Eileen, excuse me. Was the um, was talking about uh, flood floodplains. So, and this is again, I'm just going to give you guys examples because it it does affect all of us in different ways. The Lac View to Zero tribe was up in, from Upper Michigan. They are affected by the damming of some of their lakes, and they now lack wild rice, which was a main source of food for their people. They now lack walleye, a main source of food for their people. And like every culture, food the land, the animals ties in to our, our lives. They're also suffering from being shot at by simply um, fishing off of their, um, their traditional lands. It may not be their land, but they have the rights. And so they're dealing with that in 2023. Amazing. But it, you know, it happens. So um, extremely important to hear the issues that you know tribes are dealing with when it comes to, um, again, the different the issues that are happening. Um, so to emphasize, uh, the next one is to emphasize on the significance of tribal involvement going forward in conservation efforts and co to convey ways tribes can be involved and stay connected. That's extremely important because as tribes are governing the rest of their people's lives, they now have to address this new thing that's coming about. And um, most of tribes, well, not most of tribes, you have level, different levels of tribes, right? Not all tribes have this large budget or not all tribes have this extensive structure of government. Not all tribes um, have the technical assistance or the funding you know, to do those type of things. There are some tribes that are only 12 members. There are some tribes that are 75,000 members. And, and so it's, 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 there's, they're so diverse. So, um, and again, and one of the things I think it's extremely important is, you know, in strengthening tribal engagement and consultation and capacity building implementation and process to ensure that whether it be conservation efforts or in regards to the Farm Bill, as well as efforts are responsive and engaging with tribal communities. Engagement is key. So what should tribes expect to engage with? And this is not just with NGO and conservationists, but also USDA it, communities and uh, groups is helping shape the planning process and be used to develop the management uh, and develop management plans for conservation efforts. Tribes um, historically have been, have policies and laws written for them 
and then it's put in front of them and say, here you go, tribe. I wrote this for you. Now you have to abide by it. It is extremely important to have the tribes at the table to be able to develop those policies. And it's a it, tribes will collaborate with others because I obviously you guys are doing it. And we obviously need to talk because I'm totally going to send your name out to everybody I know. <laughs> um, so it, it, it's extremely important because it, you know, talking to a lot of tribes that I work with, you know, that's the, that's the last thing they want is not to be involved in a policy that's supposed to oversee um, any lands or traditional lands that they're, that they're uh, addressing or concerns. And so, and then one final thing is as we start to work on these policies and plans the burden, or maybe it's a conservation effort, the burden now lays on the tribe's shoulders. Where is the funding going to come from when the tribes are asked to even review a document? Maybe they don't have legal counsel to even do that. Um, so that is something that has to be really considered is you may be expecting the tribe to have a seat at the table but where's the funding and the expectation coming from? And does the tribe have that capacity? So tribes need assistance in funding, technical assistance, assistance, training, and capacity building to address the asks of either NGOs, conservationists, um, goals, and efforts. It's extremely important. I am, I've asked a couple of different people and told them that was coming. And the biggest thing they said is, if you're going to talk to the staffers, ensure that they understand to carry the message that funding is extremely important and um, capacity and to understand the structure of the individual tribe that you're working with or the individual community. So, how am I on time? Because you can cut me off anytime. Uh, so I wanted to share this. And um, so we were extremely honored when um, Representative Deb Holland um, and Secretary, I'm sorry, Secretary Deb Holland was um, placed at the Bureau of Indian Affairs. So the comment that she says is, our, communi our communities deserve fresh air to breathe, clean water to drink, and, and a livable planet, but right now, inaction on climate change is putting everything at risk, particularly in communities of color. And so I saw that and I thought, you know, you, you can't help but repeat that several times. The, 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 uh, below the, the um, couple paragraphs that I put in there are actually um, statements from the chairman of the Fort Mojave tribe, Chairman Tim Williams. They most recently were able to establish um, a Vikwame, uh, which is um, a, for their people what was their beginning place. And it was an, it was an amazing opportunity uh, to help preserve the land. So um, just really quickly, these are just examples of USDA. I know I'm getting cut shut cut for time here. And then um, a couple others. There's the Ute, Cheyenne, um, Cheyenne River, and then that's my name. But I just wanted to add really fast. I tried to, when I thought about the 12 minutes, I was like, holy crap. Um, but um, in regards to the insurance, one of the things that I wanted to make sure that people understand is that when it comes to tribal land, we sometimes can't have house insurance or flood insurance because of the way that our land is established. So when I, when I share the importance of really understanding the tribes, it really is important to understand each tribe in its individual uh, capacity. Um, because it's, we don't have the luxuries, you know, not all of us are, you know, um, you know, at that point, but again, there are a majority of us that can't afford that. So, so that's my name. Uh, that's my company. And I'm, I hope I helped out. Oh. And, 
I was going to say, this, and this is the book that um, I read all the time, American Indian, American Justice. It's by Vine Deloria. He writes a lot of great things. All right. Um, we have maybe time for one or two quick questions from the audience, if there is one. I'm not sure if there is, but we are at time, unfortunately. Um, I think since maybe since it's been a little while since we've heard Samantha and Eileen, uh, especially since you were our first two panelists, let's wrap up with a quick lightning round um, question before we end for the afternoon. And that lightning round question is, we've covered a lot of ground today. I suspect there are lots of things we could suggest to improve when it comes to conservation programs. But if you could change one thing with existing programs to promote conservation, what would that one thing be? Samantha, we'll start with you, and then we'll go down the line. And I'm really interested in what you have to say. Can you all hear me? Great. Okay. Um, thanks again for all the time today. Thank you for, to ESI for having us. I would say, especially after hearing my colleagues speak, um, there's a lot of information in the white paper. Hope you all grab a copy, read it. But our um, proposal to support farmer-to-farmer -farmer learning seems most relevant, especially to be moving outside of the sort of existing technical assistance, really science-based strategies, and to provide some capacity building for communities that are historically marginalized from accessing those programs. So I would say building up more farmer to farmer engagement and learning, providing funding for those purposes and capacity building, that would be my number one thing. Um, I think we can, there's probably a million different suggestions we could make about how to um, make all these programs easier to work with and things like increased sustainable funding. Um, but for for me and um, for American Rivers, I think one of the, the key changes that we um, would love to see within many of the conservation programs within NRCS um, is to align them to be, um, to work with rivers and recognize rivers as a dynamic part of our ecosystem and the land around them, the floodplains and the riparian areas as being really critical to the health of our society and our clean water. Um, so doing things like enhancing the floodplain easement program and improving that, um, and making sure that all of our other conservation programs work with rivers and help to protect and restore them as um, valuable ecosystems that they are. Hello, okay. So um, I wanna mention, because of the gentrification and displacement that I mentioned before, this is usually caused by Americans coming from the United States, as well as the Jones Act that was imposed by our colonial, imposed, well, colonial status. So I feel like conservation programs should prioritize on create a type of census that prioritizes farmers that are from Puerto Rico, living in Puerto Rico as a type of reparation because we are, are a little bit behind than other farmers in the U.S. because we have struggles. We have to go like through a couple of struggles before we get to even knowing about these conservation programs. So create an accurate census of who, because basically if I am from an American that moves to Puerto Rico and creates an agroecological project, I can benefit from a USDA conservation program, just like a humble family from the middle, from a rural part of the country. So creating that reparation and that type of responsibility towards the people that have been basically marginalized in these programs is important. And also understanding that it's equity and not equality when it comes to Puerto Rico in relation to the U.S. Benet, you put a lot of things on the table that we could euphemistically call opportunities for improvement, uh, but I'd like to give you the last word of our briefing today. Thank you. I would um, ask that it take a grassroots effect in conservation efforts because, because of what it creates, which is opportunity, equity, and growth, but it also causes a rift. And so you have large farmers who are looking at it in a different way and it's affecting their, their bottom line. 
but there has to be an understanding. So I would ask for that holistic approach to be a main point. Thank you very much. Um, we had a tremendous panel today. I think our panelists deserve a round of applause for their contribution. I'd like to say once again, special thanks to representatives Mace and Davids for joining us uh, with the pre-recorded video remarks, introductory remarks. Big thanks to Senator Welch and his great staff for helping us get the room today. Although next time maybe we'll try to get ourselves to Puerto Rico. <laughs> that looks like a pretty nice place to be today. Um, also, there are two people in our online audience who helped us uh, assemble the panel today. Big thanks to Shauna and Nathan. Uh, you know who you are, um, great friends of the organization, and we really appreciate your assistance. Also, um, there's a really significant size the team at ESI who pulls these briefings off. I'd like to say big thanks to Dan O'Brien, Omri, Allison, Anna, Molly, and Nicole, as well as Aaron, who is our newest member of Team ESI. He is hopefully watching on the live cast because he hasn't quite relocated to DC yet. Uh, but uh, Aaron, welcome aboard. And we have four tremendous summer interns, uh, Georgia, uh, Mariko, Parthav, and Sydney. Thank you for joining us and all your help. Parthav was just taking the most studious notes uh, I've ever seen of the, of the briefing today and all the live tweeting and everything that goes done. So thanks very much. I know that because I was sitting next to you. I wasn't, I'm not spying. Um, this is our last briefing for a little while, but we'll be back on July 18th. That's a Tuesday, all day ninth floor of the Senate Hart Building for the Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. We'll have six great panels, uh, tremendous speakers, executives from across the clean energy sector and the climate advocacy space. Uh, it's going to be something you don't want to miss. And at five o'clock, the lights will turn blue and there'll be a reception. So even if you're a little bit too busy to stop by during the day, that's okay. Uh, you can still come by and network. It's fun to network on Capitol Hill uh, and we'll help you with that. Um, Let's see, there it is right there. Uh, this is a survey link. Um, at the end of every briefing, if you've come to our briefings before, we always post this survey link. Uh, if you have a moment to take that survey, provide your feedback. Was there stuff that you liked today, didn't like today? Did you have any audio problems, video problems, uh, anything like that, ideas for future topics? Please um, take a moment. We read every response and it means a lot to us when people take the time to participate in our survey. We'll go ahead and wrap. Sorry for going a few minutes over, but uh, really, really great panel today. Learned a ton about conservation programs in the Farm Bill and uh, can't wait to, um, to keep learning about all sorts of great stuff when we get to the Expo. And when we get back after Labor Day, we've got a really excellent slate of congressional programming that will uh, get underway. So hope everyone has a great rest of your Wednesday and we'll see you on July 18th, hopefully for the Clean Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo. Thanks. <laughs>